All right, so we were, you were about to get back into uh, meta protocols. Yes, and I'm just noticing. Um, so let's put two pieces on the on the on the table. Okay. Um, what we're describing this lineage, mm -hmm. I will actually describe the lineage of conscious process. Yes. So we made a distinction between unconscious evolutionary process and conscious evolutionary process. We're describing the lineage of conscious evolutionary process. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then we have meta protocol. Meta protocol is is the progressive discovery of the the technique um, to further hmm, conscious evolutionary process. Mm -hmm. And and what I notice is that there's at least three distinct characteristics that are popping into my mind immediately. Okay. <laughs> Funny. What one is uh, as we begin as we as we move forward in in the um, kind of the Cambrian explosion of 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 the species mm -hmm. that has been going on now since I guess out of Africa. You mean like the cultural uh, or just all the different races, different okay, yeah, everything, yeah, the, yeah. the diversification of the okay, of humanity, the, of, yeah, the distinctness of of mm -hmm. humanity, right, the. The, the challenge of maintaining c connection, maintaining mm. coherence as right. a whole yeah. increases. Right? Yes. Um, and you effectively get uh, a couple of different things. One is the more of that total potential that you can actually contain in a wholeness, right? There's, there's, this is the you know, diversity has, is half the equation. You need diversity and continuity. You need diversity and wholeness. But the more of that potential that you can contain within something that has wholeness, the vastly more potential is actually operating inside that wholeness. However, the more difficulty there is actually to maintain that wholeness. And so you, what we will tend to perceive is some kind of collapse of the of the sort of the, the called the possibility. I, I'm making a distinction between a potential and a possibility. It is mm. possible that all humans could be part of a single wholeness. Mm. In, in the in what actually happens is it collapses down into a much smaller wholeness mm. where our existing protocols are adequate to maintain wholeness. Right? So we'll, I'm going to call these civilizations, and I'm going to distinguish that from from cultures. Right? So a civilization okay. that's able to uh, maintain something like a wholeness that is less than the whole, the, the largest whole. Right. across some set of distinct uh, d diversity gradients. Um, yeah, okay. The meta protocol is the effort to actually accomplish something that's operating at the level of the wholeness, the, the largest possible whole. Yeah. Uh, and so every variation on that theme. So you know, we thought about, for example, mathematics. Mm. Uh, mathematics allows us to communicate in spite of uh, distinct linguistic differences. Yeah. Right, so it, it completely different. It's a meta language that mm -hmm. seems to be operating at a level that is invariant across uh, explorations of linguistic space, which are very powerful and useful, but have a lot of trouble, create a lot of problems of, of increasing difficulty of maintaining continuity of expression. Yeah. So it creates mathematics as a really nice piece of a meta protocol stack. Uh, you know, for example, hmm. yeah, true. Uh, where were we going with that? <laughs> So we we brought that up in relation to trying to so in, in our previous chat, which was like a few minutes ago, right? We were thinking about um how I guess I guess I guess yeah I have this this is like what I'm what's coming up for me is just bringing the sense of so the original thing was about genres, right? But the idea even there the point was how can I figure out how can I know genres well enough so that I'm making an informed decisions. When thinking about coming up with prompts, questions, formats, whatever, coordinating mechanisms to get people to coordinate, right? So there's there's the old genre. So I guess the implicit belief there is that um, sticking to the existing formats and the existing, like you know, so writing uh, the same style of essay that everyone else is already seeing that has like diminishing returns on getting like excited, kind of uh, energetic. Uh, coordination so to, I, the belief is that if we want to get fresh energy fresh perspective and kind of like you need to some to cross the threshold and i guess the hope is that um this is interrelated with with the like meta protocol stuff in some way right yeah yeah hold on so hmm. 
Yeah, there's a couple. So one is diminishing returns. Two, yeah. we're actually at a point of extreme diminishing returns across yes. most of the environment that is, that's is that's available. And so it's a, sort of a double whammy. Categorically, it has diminishing returns as a technique. But then two, we're kind of at the at the asymptote of that. Yes, feels like it, yeah. Right. Everything has to squeeze out just pure viscerality, right? It's just mm. sort of maximizing um, simple, you know, dopamine response curves and mm. and sort of adrenal hit. Like that's basically all you can all you can do. Mm. Uh, and you no, know, that has a half life too, right? So we're reaching the end of the half life of that, and that's just straight burnout, right? If you, you yeah. take cocaine until it doesn't give you any positives, so we've moved from from kind of like nutrition mm. into cocaine, and now with cocaine, we're reaching kind of like the end of the road, right? Uh, so that's, those are like two different points. So then, then the, hmm. the, the meta point is something like, okay, given that, we need to actually move ourselves into a mode of, of expanding hmm. territory. But we also notice maybe maybe two different things. One is we want to move into an expanding territory that actually avoids the closure trap. Yes. If we do that. Yes. Uh, and I would propose, by the way, there's a couple of reasons. One reason is just because we notice that because of the increasing bandwidth that's in the environment, this accelerates the half-life of closure. Mm. Wait, so when you say accelerate the half-life of closure, so you mean that um, it's now possible for like ex exploit type dynamics to just take longer, sort of, right? The opposite. The, uh, the opposite. It be because exploit because there's so much evolutionary process in the environment. Mm. And the ability to disseminate every discovery by evolutionary process is effectively costless and perfectly replicable. Uh -huh. That means that our ability to explore a closed domain is very fast. Yeah. Um, if, if you, you get these high spikes, but short, think of like technology advance curves. Right. Uh, it took 100 years for X to occur, but in 50 right. years for Y, 25 years. Yeah. Um, so what that means is that the technique of simply mm -hmm. expanding the frontier to buy time mm -hmm. Doesn't buy time anymore because you know. Let's say oh, you okay, up, okay, okay. Another genre, right, 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 two right. years. But we're right back where we are right now. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. So we yeah, got to do see. something categorically different. We have to actually think about a completely different way of operating. Correct. We're not opening up a, a a big, an arbitrarily big finite domain. Right. We're actually engaging in activity that the act of opening increases our capacity to open in mm. an unlimited fashion. Right. So that that's the big. That's like the big category shift. Right. From answers from really, really good answers to really, really good questions yeah. as a as a mode of operations. Yeah. Oh, that's so just to just to restate the thing for myself. Uh yeah. So what's happening is the there there used to be these long cycles where, you know, maybe even like in music you come up with some new genre or style, and then oh, it has like a 10, 15 year window where oh, all kinds of new things happen, new people get involved, whatever. And now it just moves so fast that it gets condensed to like a year and a, you have like this year and a half ish maybe window where you got to say everything you could possibly say and you got to kind of use that springboard to you know if you genuinely had something deeper than just a, a superficial aesthetic right if you had some underlying um insight about how people should be or how people should really i don't know like this is one of those things you have to so creative it's like you get on one hand you have this excitement of wow things move really fast but on the other hand, you don't have a lot of time to like personally process what is happening while it's happening, right? Like so there is an I feel like there's an emotional challenge for you know leaders or of, of movements or people who are working things like they just have to but there's opportunity. So it's a very exciting times. My uh, my daughter is just peeking in. You can oh, hello. <laughs> Cute. Do you want to say hi? It's okay. You can be shy. Mm -hmm. this, this is the first time I've spoken with him, so I'm a little shy too. I'm the most shyest. You are. <laughs> you got time. Yeah. <clears throat> so we're we're talking about something that is a little bit. Hmm. You probably will find it kind of boring. In fact, I imagine many people will find it kind of boring. But some mm. people will find it very. The word I was thinking, by the way, I think is probably enthusiasm. Hmm. Excitement. Right. And the. The root of this entheos, right. right? So to actually have the spirit of the divine within, like to actually mm. have the right. divine come and through you, right? Enthusiastic, right? And even inspired, right? Like we, the we the phrase now comes to mean, uh, I guess it's it's been like 
cliched and and made super fit. But the root of it is to be with spirit. Like so, maybe you would say spiritedness, right? Just to to be with, driven. Um. Yes, in fact, I, I would I would point out that one of the things that I've definitely discovered over the past five years is, huh, funny. Mm -hmm. It's almost like lineage recovery. Oh, I also this in a very strong way. Yeah. Um. There's some kind of adversarial function. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't necessarily know if it's a conscious adversarial function. It could just be entropy. Right. Um, but it has the characteristic of um, hmm, closing, pr producing closure, mm -hmm. and therefore exploitation on all the good stuff. Like I'll be very simple about it. Right. Uh, one of the things that happens then is as a result of being on the on the tail end of what I think is a very long arc of okay. this process is that we now are, I call it upside down land. So we take mm -hmm. a word like enthusiasm right. and we literally understand it to be the inverse of what it actually means, right. which has two consequences. One is if we endeavor to be enthusiastic, we find ourselves behaving the opposite of what is proper. Mm -hmm. And we find ourselves separated from the thing itself. Right. Right. Which we may in fact very much need. Mm -hmm. Um, so this is like the you know the 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 torch, mm -hmm. yeah. Somebody is blowing out the torches, or somebody is taking the energy of the torches yes. to do other stuff besides what's Correct. proper. Correct. Yeah. So one of our challenge is to hold integrity with that yes. and be able to distinguish between what is say light, mm -hmm. and 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 be able to say you know what this is this word enthusiasm it's actually part of of our of our lineage. Mm. We're going to re recover it. Right. We're going to bring it back in. We're going to right. bring it back into its proper place. Right. And then we're going to be able to use it again. So it's like that kind of a thing. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I have that with uh, ambition. So if you go into the root of ambition, it's like, it meant, like MB, right? It means to walk around and canvas for votes. And my interpretation of it is that it's very social. It's very grounded in, in like humane processes. Like to be ambitious for me, like, or like, I feel like there's this, it's like human, not humanitarian, but like you know, just um, it it's come to mean like prestige seeking, right? And I feel like when the two get conflated, it then becomes difficult to talk about, um, you know, really giving a shit, really wanting to help people, really. Oh, wow. uh, -huh. uh huh. Yeah. Well, okay. I, I link it to actually the word prestige. Right. So. Oh, so. I, <laughs> uh, sorry. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, so I had, as you said that, I was like, okay, oh, wait, I know two different versions of the word oh, prestige. prestige. Oh, man, yeah. Like, yeah happening, it pops. Right. Um, this brilliant guy, uh, John Heinrichs, wrote a book called The Secrets of Our Success, where he basically Sick. was doing a, you know, really worth reading. Okay. It, like, best understanding from a variety of different disciplines of how human beings came to be human beings, like kind of anthropology, neuroscience, things like that. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I pulled away from it was that, Homo sapiens, let's say uniquely among hominids, that I'll, I'll make, this is my understanding, so I could be just wrong. And I'm not claiming that necessarily he's saying this, by the way. Sure. Um, but Homo sapiens exclusively among hominids have two distinct um, social uh, relationships, particularly among males. One is a dominance hierarchy, which yeah. is a very classic thing we that everybody that. has. Yeah. The other is what he calls the prestige hierarchy. So that he's using the uh -huh. word prestige in that sense. And okay. it's an, the idea of the prestige hierarchy is an, uh, a relationship mm -hmm. where there is, in fact, an actual hierarchy in competence. Let's say, for mm. example, one individual knows how to uh, chip uh, flint into sharp right. arrows. Yeah. And one individual is a young, uh, young and doesn't know how. Right? right. So there's an actual gradient in competence, right. yeah. which is properly discerned. Right? So it is real, a real gradient in real competence. Right. And the underlying dynamics of the deeper dominance hierarchy, which would tend to prevent learning from happening, doesn't take place. Instead, there's a learning relationship that occurs, which is to say the more wise elder teaches the younger this new technique. Right. Now, think about that in terms of game theory. Game mm -hmm. theoretically, this reduces the local advantage of the older, uh, right. the elder. The right. elder had a unique competence which is now being distributed to others, which in many ways could be competitors. Correct. But it does so in a fashion which increases the fitness of the larger the group. group. Yeah. So 
to the degree to which hominids humans are able to operate where the fitness of the whole group actually does right. produce a higher fitness for the individuals in the group right so right. i'm actually recapitulating group theory in a particular fashion yeah you have this new possibility mm -hmm. prestige that emerges and of course prestige only really emerges wow this is pretty intense in the in the milieu of what we were just talking about with regard yeah. to that, that yeah. lineage of the passing of the torch right there's a whole if if there's not new stuff to be learned that actually is significant in value, right? Then prestige doesn't have any point. Yeah, right. Yeah. But if if me if me learning something and then handing it off to you and you saving you the effort of having to learn it the first time, so you can then go on and learn better stuff, right? That you hand off to the next generation. Yeah. That creates like a very different fitness function for everybody who's part of that lineage. Yes. Yeah. Prestige. Oh, yeah. So, ambition. Prestige. The, the yeah. map. Very nice. Think about it. Okay, now ambition is the open field of exploring what's available within your actual social environment, tuning into prestige in the positive sense, right. which creates the 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 highest allocation of attentional resources yeah. and learning gradients, which is the richest field for the actual population. So there you go. That's so good. Yeah. So I I didn't even consider that. So like I have been operating with the oh when I say prestige I mean really the the illusion of of what you're describing right. So it's like the pretense. I, the the kind of uh mistaking the 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 menu for the meal or like you know the the epaulets or you know whatever whatever kind of falsified signals you can do to try and extract um without contributing ah <sighs> man I I'm as you were saying the stuff about like the prestige economy uh did you say economy I I'm, I might have completed that in my head but like, I'm thinking of um Pericles from I, I didn't say that you said it and it's good <laughs> yeah oh yeah so, so I I have this phrase. So I've I've a bunch of thinking about status economies and like so the the concept of a prestige economy kind of comes very naturally. This idea of okay, like what is a good king or a good like authority figure that is you know kind of respected and admired. So this is like, and king here is like any kind of leader, right? In any, it's like this archetypal kind of thing. And it's I've here's my current kind of thesis. Like a good king is a is kind of a a a custodian of the honor economy or the prestige economy of his people. So it, 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 and in the past, it would just so have happened that he's also at the top of the dominance hierarchy. But like, you know, once there, whether or not you are a good king depends on how you kind of run the prestige economy, the status economy. And part of how you do that is that, you know, so it's like the, the, the crown is a theater prop, basically. And everyone is kind of directing their attention at you. And, and your job as the king is to, is to really keep the, status on a prestige economy flowing as as beautifully as possible and what ha the, the tragic outcomes is when the king is like selfish and needy and he wants to be adored and he demands that everyone you know kind of like prostrate before him and say oh i'm so great i'm so great but the good king right is the one who receives it as almost like a servant custodian and it's like okay i'm here to redirect this to you know let's honor this soldier for his sacrifices let's honor this uh poet for her contribution and so ah, nice nice by, yeah. by being yeah, yeah. that Exactly. Right. And the tragic thing. And so I, when I was reading about um, in, if you read Pericles funeral oration, which is like 2,400 years, old, like pre BC time, right. It's striking how like every paragraph is just abundance mindset. It's very, you know, we, we are willing to share with, you know, let our, let our, let people from foreign lands come and visit our city and see all of how we do things. Like they can try to copy us, but they won't succeed because what makes us great is not any specific material, but like our high, like, so I'm translating, but it's like our high trust, you know, our, our trust in each other, our willingness to pursue excellence, you know, our willingness to rest. And it's just so striking that um, when you contrast with like, there's very few political messages have that same level. The closest I would say is actually I've seen is, uh, Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, which is the same kind of, you know, like we are here to consecrate. First, you, first of all, you honor your ancestors, your lineage, right? Like those are the, like, because that that contextualizes for everybody else what you're about. And it's this sets the frame, right? And then we're like, okay, um, we are going to continue their work, basically. And we're going to honor the people who are continuing the work. And, and even just having a good leader set that for everyone else as a kind of... Um, shelling point frame of reference like let's just all think about this and let's just all go that way it's so simple but it happens so rarely and i'm just i'm always like you know we could 
all be doing this in our own respective domains. And I try to do it on, kind of do a version of it on like Twitter even, like just looking for people who write like um, interesting book reviews or nerd post, I call it nerd posting, and just like celebrating that. Like, like so you accumulate some amount of status from having followers or whatever, but you redirect that to whoever the new guy is that is doing interesting work. And then that sets the cultural norm that hopefully brings in more and more people. Yeah, hold on. So, hmm. Whatever's interesting to you. Yeah, I mean, the hard part is so many. Uh, <laughs> so what, what, what I would put is almost like, uh, yeah, here's what I'll do. I'll, I'll take the notion of King, which by the way, I, I completely agree. Mm-hmm. And, and I actually have had conversations with uh, the Hawaiians, Ooh. the uh, Hawaiian Hawaiians, mm. not moved to Hawaii, but people who are, who are from Hawaii. And this is their their story as well. Like it's yeah. not... It's not mysterious to people who've actually who actually lived this for real. That there's a a notion. Uh, again, I'll be saying this in my own way. So this yeah. is not. Uh, yeah, your paraphrase. Yeah. That, that a given individual has a a quantity of mana, which is to say mm, a but, yeah. a quantity of the fundamental potency of the universe mm-hmm. that that is expressed through them, and they have a a, a kuliana, which is to say a, an an aspect of the universe which is their proper thing for responsibility. As it turns out, it's very nice that if you are are able to perceive your kuleana properly and you're able to express your mana properly, you have exactly the right potency to care for that which you're supposed to care for. But a uh, an elite, like an, an aristocrat, as you go kind of up the stack, uh, they have responsibility for larger holes. So the king of, let's say, a particular island would have responsibility for the whole island in all of its characteristics. Right? So they'd have responsibility for the ecology. That responsibility for the sacred economy and the responsibility for the prestige economy mm. that makes up the, the wholeness of that particular location. Um, okay, so that's like, yeah, chapter. In, that's yes. Okay, but now what I do is I'm going to take it down to a very simple mm. um, experience that I have had many times, which is uh, my wife mm-hmm. is really really good at representing the whole with regard to a large of our of our family mm-hmm. with regard to a large number of things, and this is important. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll give you an example. <laughs> it's, it's fine. I have to kind of laugh at it, which is like, from my point of view, this is an extraordinary capacity. I would imagine right. for wives, it's like, yeah, but whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, like, let's go with uh, de- design, like like designing the interior of the house. Okay. Um, you can get into conflict in mm. with, with in a family if if the wife. And the husband are are arguing or trying to to agree, right? Trying yeah. to engage. Oh, we'll also be talking about the difference between po- politics and politeia. Okay. So if we're great engaging in politics in the household, and we're trying mm-hmm. to negotiate two isolated individuals into some kind of coordination, mm. it, it's very difficult. That's not how it works in my household. In my household, she is the the queen, mm-hmm. which means that she takes responsibility for the whole. She mm. does a better job of representing my own needs and values than I would do. Right. She considers them very, very deeply, naturally can express her own needs and values. And so she can intrinsically out of herself produce a result that is better than if we tried to sort of negotiate between the two of us. Yeah. Right. This is a daily experience I have quite frequently. So I'm not, I'm just bringing it up <laughs> as an example of like, yeah, I can imagine that scaling to larger and larger groups. I can imagine right. particular individuals right. who are acting kind of like the queen of a group. Now that, by right. the way, you can't micromanage that shit. This, yeah. this, this is a different kind of thing. But you can right. definitely hold, mm-hmm. truly hold other people's values right. deeply. Right. And and support the expression of their values into the the commonwealth of what's happening in a way that causes them to feel like it's better than if they had been endeavoring to do it themselves. Right. Uh that's possible. It's a real thing that can actually happen. I've experienced I've first person. So I've seen it as well. Yeah. It seems like a thing that could happen as you describe yeah. it. Uh, okay, what was the other one that came up as you were talking? Um, Politeia? So you're going to say that? Oh, yeah, politics and Politeia. It's the same inversion, uh, you know, uh, a- ambition. So poly- politics, as we understand it, is exactly the same thing or it maps to the same kind of side of the line as a prestige and ambition in the negative sense. Uh, and it, it largely is an effort um, to create a synthetic agreement Wow, okay. between isolated individuals or mm-hmm. subgroups. Politeia, which is the actual Greek root, mm-hmm. is the understanding that there actually is a whole 
Mm. And the effort is actually to, to, to discern the what is in what is coming from the whole. And if discerned properly, every member who is part of that lineage, part of that politeia, will simply recognize, yep, that's that's right. So it's a different kind of intent, a different underlying premise about what's even trying to be done. And so there's a, like a, the denaturing of politeia, which happens when the wholeness, when you've lost the wholeness, then you're trying to reconstitute the wholeness through a synthetic process, which is merely mm -hmm. an aggregate. You get back to politics. Right, so you right, fall right. from politeia to politics. Right. And that distinction, I think, is a very, like, is a recurring theme. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, the quote that's coming to me now is something about, like, uh, you know, so tradition has to be the preservation of a flame and not, like, the worshipping of ashes, right? Like, and, and there's a lot of, you know, something good once happened here. And so Emerson has some quotes as well. He's like, you know, um, all the famous young men that we read in, like, just the books that were venerated from people, the people who wrote them were once young men figuring stuff out, like thinking and, and writing and arguing with themselves and whatever. And then there's this later generation of people who are like, oh, look at all these wise authors. Let's just take what they say wholesale and and just, you know, kind of turn it into scripture that we we don't even don't question, right? Like just that you have a very strict interpretation of it and you don't you don't deviate from it but like that's not what they did so in a way you're, you're kind of dishonoring them by pedestalizing them right the way to actually nice. honor them is to to continue that tradition of of argument and and discussion and re recreate I get, it's so funny for me sometimes i've actually been i've actually encountered like in, in like a micro micro version of this um this is like this is a quick story uh my wife was watching a video of uh a youtuber who's quite popular he's a like a famous nerd something kind of the precise channel but he he was basically reading out um prime numbers for three hours like that was like a performance art kind of thing and so i just tweeted i'm watching my wife watch some guy recite prime numbers it's amazing and then he the the youtuber he retweeted it and the funny thing is i'm i'm very confident that he appreciated what i was trying to kind of gesture at right which is that here's an appreciation for a person's thing and there were people who replied to to me like, oh, you know, like he's not just some guy. Put some respect on his name, blah blah blah. And it's funny to me because I feel that, um, in a way, describing yeah. him as a person was my way of respecting him. Like as a, I don't know if I'm doing this. I'm, I'm, I'm not getting the details right exactly. But the vibe is there's a way in which um a king's courtiers, uh, will ask you will demand that you kind of uh you know th th like what's the word like curtsy and and kind of fla uh, not flagellate uh, prostrate yourself there's there's some word for the way you kind of bow genu flag. yes yes you like please genuine like how you better genuine flag. and so, uh, i think okay here's a better story there's one and it made, uh when alexander supposedly met diogenes and alexander mm. shows up and he's like what can i do for you and diogenes is like get out of my son you're blocking my son. <laughs> and Alexander was amused and he's like, oh, I, I like this guy. You know, if I wasn't Alexander, I would like to be Diogenes. But Alexander's, um, like his middle management people, like his uh, courtiers or whatever, his courtiers were offended on his behalf. Like, how dare you speak to the king that way? But Alexander was fine. He's like, oh, this is fun. You know, it's for, like I, it's not often that I get to have this kind of interaction with someone who doesn't, who sees me as a person and not as my crown, right? And... I yeah, so th this is this dynamic I keep seeing kind of play out where, you know, you criticize someone from a place of, you don't, you're not even thinking of doing a personal attack. You're just thinking, oh, here's a leader in any domain and they're doing something. And you're like, you know, I, I think that what you just, you offer like a peer-to-peer a -peer criticism of whatever they're doing from a place of, you know, if I were in your shoes, I would want. And then they receive it well, but like they are fanboys or whatever, like how dare you, you know. Uh -huh. And it's just... It's kind of tragic to it's funny it's a bit sad it's uh it, it is what it is to some degree but i, I feel like people I, I think the degree to which we educate people about these dynamics because i think people participate in them without consciously realizing what's going on right right and, yeah that that notion of, of, of being aware of it mm -hmm. um hmm. yeah I, 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 that's not banal that that point there is not banal uh mm -hmm. if we if we connect it back up the pro mm -hmm. the premise is something like We've been in, oh wow okay so that's mm. it we humans yeah. have been engaging in uh, unconscious evolutionary process mm -hmm. in the biggest genre of all which is culture space 
Um, and one of the, so many of the things that you're talking, right, at this last bit we're talking about mm -hmm. are things that are discovered through that unconscious evolutionary process. Uh -huh. And part of what we have to actually do is begin to engage in conscious evolutionary process in culture space itself. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm feeling it. So I'm feeling a lot of connections here. So it's like in the past, there were kings who, you know, because it was unconscious, dominance, hierarchies, whatever, people would be like, oh, the king is literally superhuman. He's God. Like, oh, he's the embodiment of God. And and there were people who, the courtiers, some of the courtiers might know, oh, that's just a metaphor. But like the the kind of illiterate masses might be like, oh, he's literally got he's superhuman, superpower. And that's actually, you know, it creates this like violent, complex, messy, surge crowd. It's like a mob kind of mind mentality. And back then, yeah. the more powerful mob defeats the less powerful mob. But now we're approaching a stage where, okay, we are aware of the nature of the theater that we perform. And it's possible for us to respect a leader as a leader while also knowing that he's human, right? And that allows for, like, there's, there's that barrier that needs to cross where people can discuss the leader without uh, being swept up in the, in the procession of it to the point where they suspend their critical thinking. Yes, yes. Well, I would say that, you know, uh... You know, again, this is this is part of one of the things that I've been talking about a lot. But I'll, I'll put it put forth as a premise mm -hmm. that um, the set of dynamics uh, of this of the sort that you were just describing, one of its most profound negative consequences is it disrupts the underlying signals that allow us to properly engage in shifting from optimization, culture optimization mode to explore mode. Mm, so, mm, mm makes that fragile yes um, and that's very very bad because this is why i make that distinction between paradigm shift and paradigm collapse or paradigm catastrophe right. if it's locked in if it's insensitive to its underlying signaling mechanisms mm -hmm. then shit gets really fucked up yeah yeah before you finally shatter right it has to shatter if it's fragile and locked in it has to shatter to move to the new place and that shattering is shattering is quite disorderly yes um so what you want to maintain at a meta level is you want to maintain simultaneously a rich, effective, um, optimizing, optimizing culture, but you also need to maintain more fundamentally a very connected, fluid, high sensitivity um, ability to modulate between those that and explore mode. And the ability, by the way, to actually move into explore mode, right? It's yeah. one thing to say, oh, we need to move to explore mode. It's a whole other thing to say, oh, right. shit, we accidentally yeah. killed all the explorers. Right. Extinct yeah. explore mode in our species. Well, I guess we're done now because that's yeah. that. that. That reminds me of uh, one of my frustrations that uh, or I express often. I said that, you know, it would be it would actually be better if people could admit to themselves that. Uh, so one of the distinctions I make is like sitcom mode and adventure mode, which is kind of the same thing. Like, you know, so sitcom mode is like you're in, you're living, just kind of enjoying your day-to-day -day life. And then adventure mode I is see. you're going out into dramatic things. The problem is that a lot of people don't admit to themselves that they're living in sitcom mode. And there's nothing wrong with living in sitcom mode, right? It has its place and whatever. But there's a lot of people who, the nature of their sitcom is they pretend that they're going on an adventure and they use yes. adventure language. And that, that fucks up adventurers who are like, hey, you want to go on an adventure? And the sitcom guy is like, yes. And he doesn't actually mean it. But like now like the, the utility of utterances has been devalued because like you can't trust anyone when this. And ah, yeah, so it's just... This is, by the way, exactly the distinction that I was trying to make when I wrote that essay on, on simulated thinking and thinking. Mm. Simulated thinking is uh. <laughs> simultaneously mm. a particular uh, style of thinking, but more importantly, one that takes itself as being the mm. other thing. Right. So yeah. sitcom mode is not just that you're in sitcom, right. but also that you obligately per per falsely perceive sitcom as adventure. Yeah. That's a different. That's a really yeah. tricky place. To right. Play. It rhymes exactly with, you know, like, oh, the problem with communication is the illusion that it has taken place, right? Or like, if we admitted what we don't understand, that's the excellent first step to getting towards understanding. But nobody does, most people don't do that. Most people are like, oh, I think I understand. Yeah, I know what I'm talking about. Like, <laughs> you, we have to begin with the premise of maybe we don't. You know, that's like Socratic innovation, right? Like 3,000 years ago, and we're still kind of getting around to learning it. Like acknowledging oh, yeah. the limits of our knowledge. Yeah, this is that the, the notion of... um how do you do it right? Ah, uh, something like vulnerability and expression. Yes, yes, and and again in like a low cell, low trust environment where you like, let's say you're living in like a USSR kind of shit where like expressing doubt and uncertainty might get you killed and or you know like thrown to whatever. So people yeah. 
uh, un- semi unconsciously, semi culturally indoctrinated race to to be safe. You have to pretend that you know what you're talking about, even when you don't, and then that just muddies up your everything. <laughs> yes, it muddies up everything. Well, what it right. does is it, it that notion of like the 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 largest gradient hole. Mm. It, it reduces it down to a much smaller actual like right. a potential in the in the in the field, um, but it may be much smaller in potential, but it might actually be well optimized for a particular niche. Right. So this is the trick. Yeah. Um, you know, it's the it's the short term long term trade off problem. Mm. Uh, if I if I'm in an op, let's go with like the Bronze Age. If I'm in a, if I'm in a particular um, environment niche that say lasts a thousand years, mm-hmm. it may in fact be locally optimal for me to get trapped in this structure because it's it, it's it's stable, right? Yeah, uh, change in the niche isn't adequate to make it worth my while to actually move. Of course, what happens is is then I get something which is fragile and it, it's it's primed for a catastrophic collapse, the Bronze right. Age collapse, for example. Yeah, yeah. When yeah. enough change has been built up on the in the sort of the debit side of the account, then mm. there's just no way to gain it, and you just collapse. Right. Uh, so that's a big back to conscious process. Like if you're an unconscious process, very difficult to to effectively impossible. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is Moloch, right? This is the Moloch problem. Yeah. Yes. Um, if the long term is outside the zone of my conscious process, then I mm-hmm. can't even perceive it as a valid strategy, and I'm locked into optimizing against some sort of a local optimum. Mm-hmm. I have to have some mechanism to actually bring that long term inside the zone of my conscious process, mm-hmm. and then it's actually obvious. Right. Oh, can I share something with you? Sure. This is this is. I mean, it's related to what I just said. It's it sort of feels like a little bit distinct, but I'd like to share it with you, yeah, in particular. Mm-hmm. Not that I've shared it with anybody else. Um, I was really thinking about the Moloch problem. Okay, and and what I came up with as a way of sort of ad- addressing the, how to respond to it, like how how it's actually nature has solved this problem many times. This is mm-hmm. kind of the key. Point. So, what is that solution? And the way I thought about it was actually: Do you know the thing called the marshmallow test or the cookie yes. test? Yes, yeah, yeah. Desire the I like cookies better. Okay. I like cookies better. So I'll use the cookie test as the example. Okay. Sure. And the way I'll, the way I'll characterize it is this: I would propose that the cookie test is the Moloch problem, mm-hmm. but linearly as opposed to horizontally. And so the okay. Moloch problem proposes two or more agents horizontally. I see it, I see it. yeah. The cookie test is me against myself in time. Mm-hmm. If I don't have the capacity to perceive future me right. as being me, then right. fuck that guy. Yeah. I'm eating the cookie right now. 100% right. of the time, it's not even yeah. a choice. Yeah. But if I can't otherwise, but if I always perceive future me as being me, Right. Then obviously I'm going to wait until I get two cookies, or in this case, the way I yeah. like to make this one. Yeah. So that's the question. Mm-hmm. Back to the index of kings, if we are in fact operating in a mode where there are our parts endeavoring to gather into an aggregate, mm-hmm. then we are fundamentally in the mode of Moloch, and there will be a Moloch. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I see it. Yep. But if we're able to get to the point where we actually are operating truly, and I don't mm-hmm. mean like pretending, but actually right. operating truly with a, a, a real presence of the whole. Yeah. Then we're in the cookie test, and we're and we're satisfied. We're actually answering correctly, and every time, like simply, it's actually very simple. Like it's not it's not complex. When I perceive that you and I are both expressions of a lineage that is a wholeness that I am part of, and mm-hmm. that I value its 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 richness and existence regardless of whether or not I ever perceive it, cathedral consciousness, then right action is a matter of competence, not a matter of calculation. Yes. Yes. Uh, we have like a minute left, so I think that that was that's a pretty interesting thing to chew on. That I think we can we can end on because I don't want to take too much of your time. But uh, this is this is this is very interesting. Um, yeah, I'm I'm gonna rewatch this and think about it. This is just a lot to to chew on. Thank you so much, Jordan. This has been uh this I don't I don't I don't know what I was expecting exactly, but it this has been more than that. So. Thank you very much, and uh, I will oh, post uh, share a link with you when I'm done. I appreciate being given the opportunity to talk with you. I mean, honestly, thank you so I much. Really do. Thank you so much. I'm sure we'll chat again at some point, and maybe yeah. I'll come find you at some point. A good, prompt, a good prompt will come along. <laughs> yes, it will. It will. All right. Okay. See you. Take care. Oh. Goodbye.